So, I want to talk about um, an area that has been um, very neglected in the past decades. And I'm going to talk about the Chilean Fjord region and about the experiences that um, we uh, gained in um, studying this region. Well, comparably few people know that in the, at the southern tip of South America, there is a huge fjord region. Actually, in coastline, it's even the largest fjord region in the world. Um, but it also is um, the least known and also the least studied fjord region. Well, one reason for this is definitely the enormous size of this region. Well, in north-south extension, it is a little bit more than 1,500 kilometers, which is less than the Norwegian fjord region. But in coastline, it is huge. The reason for this is that um, the Chilean fjord region is made of two mountain ranges with... Um, this is the laser. Um, with the High Andes as a continental mountain range, forming the big um, um, continental glacier, um, um, fjord, fjords, and south of 42 degrees, um, the mountain, um, the coastal mountain range is partially submerged and forms this e um, enormous portion of the archipelagos, which is then fractured um, through um, channels and little fjords, and this is the part in the in the west. So. It is a little bit like these fractals. Um, when you just zoom in a little bit closer, you will notice that it splits up into almost the same pattern and you will find even more and finer fjords and, and finer channels. And the closer you get, you will, no you will notice that there's even more um, islets and um, um, channels showing up. This is just where the resolution of Google Earth um, in this part of the world um, stops at more than 10 kilometers altitude. But I can promise you, when you get closer, you will find even more islands. And um, the um, show are calculated that on um, a sea chart um, scale, the entire length of the coastline would exceed 80,000 kilometers. If we would stretch this out, this would reach twice around the globe. So, well, this is definitely one reason why it is poorly studied, because it's just so big. Another reason is um, has technical historical reasons, because most of what we know about the biota from this area has been gathered during um, large expeditions between 1800 and 1950, mainly. And in these times, this area was poorly, uh, poorly charted, so these big vessels had to maintain a safety distance from shore. And with their techniques, that was grab sampling and dredge sampling, they were mainly able to um, sample the um, soft sediments in the center of the channels and the fjords. Today we know that most of the biomass and most of the diversity um, is attached to the rocky slopes, and this especially in the um, shallower regions. These parts are accessible by scuba diving and with remotely operated vehicles, both techniques that by scientists have very poorly been applied in the fjord region. So you can say that um, what we are studying now is almost terra incognito because nobody has done it before. Another reason um, is fashion. Well, um, we have to admit that science follows fashion. And fashion is somehow um, promoted by politics. Scientists tend to um, do research where funding is, and funding is often where economic interest is, or political interest is. And so a lot of science has been dedicated to the polar region, has been dedicated to the deep seas, um, but fjord regions somehow kept out of fashion for a long time. It also um, has to do with um, personal preferences of the scientists. In times where scuba diving became popular as a mean of um, exploring the oceans, well, scientists had the choice that to go either to an area um, like Chile, where a big part of uh, the year it is cold, the water is cold, it is rainy, it is, um, it is windy, and um, uh, we have precipitation that, um, um, well, are not really dry or that they could go to the tropics with pinacolada, warm water, um, coral reefs. So the choice was clear for them. A lot of focus was then taken to the tropical areas, and fjord regions again dropped out of the search pattern for scientists. Well, the aim of the UNAI Foundation with their research facility is to promote, um, to create a fashion um, for fjord science. And um, we want to help to fill um, knowledge gaps, dramatic knowledge gaps that um, um, remained in these um, areas. 
Well, we do this in two ways. For one, one way is that we have um, two fjords um, close by the station, which we investigate um, on a multidisciplinary approach. We try to attract as many researchers from may, um, many different fields to um, create um, um, as complete as possible picture of a fjord ecosystem. And a fjord ecosystem for us um, starts here at the peaks of the mountains where the water, um, the way of the water starts. It goes through the lush um, extra tropical rainforests along the slopes and then finally ends in the, de um, in the depth of the ocean. These are um, the two fjords that we have at hand. It's the uh, Komal Fjord in the northern part and the Rini Wef Fjord um, um, close by in the south. And these two fjords, um, luckily, um, already exhibit a large variety of um, fjord elements and fjord structures. So um, it represents already a big fraction of what we can find throughout the entire fjord region. Um, the idea is to gather this information to understand um, certain processes um, in fjords. And because most of the other research that is done in fjord region is very punctual also in time, to get a little bit more long-term studies, to get an idea about the din dynamics going on in these, uh, these systems. The second research line that we are promoting and realizing by ourselves is to do inventory and mapping throughout the entire fjord region. Well, since this um, is a lot of effort, um, um, logistic and infrastructure effort, um, we have to focus, and we are focusing on the marine environment mainly, because for one reason, we think it is the most underrepresented in um, science. And um, the second is that, well, um, my wife and me, we are marine scientists, <laughs> so um, this makes it easier. Well, I already mentioned that it is a logistic effort. One of the main problems, besides the big size of this um, region, is that um, we don't have, um, for example, research vessel as, at, hand, at hand. There is a 70-meter research vessel, the Vidal Mas, it's mainly an oceanographic vessel, um, but um, we do not have a mid-size or small-size research vessel that could um, promote um, this work. So scientists rely on fisher boats, on supply vessels, which, of course, don't make working easier. Nevertheless, we were able throughout the years to um, put more and more dots on the map. Our next expedition will start in three days and we will go to Isla Navarino and try to get a more and more complete picture um, of the region. Well, findings. I don't want to focus on individual findings. Um, I want to give more the general findings um, for the bigger picture. Outstanding high diversity. Well, we heard um, from the map um, from Jesse that there is a lot of blue and white dots. Well, the white do uh, dots are, are already explained. It hasn't been studied a lot. But blue dots with few diversity, well, they were searching mainly in the channels um, where it is more or less boring. Now we find a huge diversity on the rocky slopes. It starts with the big things with marine mammals. Um, um, from halfly terrestrial mammals through mainly marine um, mammals and um, seabirds, which received a lot of attention because they are um, charismatic and they are big and they are easy to see. But we have to keep in mind that this is less than 5% of the overall diversity that we have in the fjord region. Most of the diversity is hidden under the surface. They are smaller things. They are invertebrates, mainly benthic invertebrates. And there we can find um, densities of species which are absolutely not common for these latitudes. We can find densities of species that are um, um, more like to be um, in subtropical areas. Just some examples of this. We have high endemism rates. Well, um, in such a fractioned environment, we find a lot of species that are restricted to either the fjord region, to certain parts of the fjord region, or on a um, genetic level, we even find um, endemism between different fjords. We have um, a high fraction, a high portion of unknown species. Well, we expected to find new species. Um, but um, what we did not expect is that we would find, um, well, we went to the um, easiest accessible areas. We were searching um, um, in the first 30 meters, how deep we could dive that's scratching at the surface. And um, we sampled the biggest, most eye-catching, most abundant species, and we got more than 10% new species in this selection. And we find entire new communities that have never been described. Cold water coral banks in 20 meters. Hydro coral reefs we've never read and, um, or heard about before. Um, banks of brachypods. This is a photo that could have been taken 600 million years ago when they dominated the sea. Um, it wasn't known that they exist in shallow water still. 
and last but not least, microbial, microbial, microbial communities associated with um, volcanic springs in shallow water too. We have a highly complex hydrographic situation. Well, in fact, all physical and chemical factors um, have strong gradients that interact on a very complex interference pattern, creating a lot of niches. Freshwater, salinity, wave impact, currents. Um, and inside these channels, they in interfere in almost an undefinite um, combinations. And we have a strong subdivision into biogeographic regions. Well, we know about two main um, um, sociogeographic barriers, one um, at the peninsula Taitao and Gulf of Penas, where south of it, um, the main uh, fjords are very strongly glacial influenced and therefore comparably poor, while the ch um, channels are rich again in uh, diversity, but with very different species than in the north, or south of the Straits of Magellan. <coughs> Here's some examples from central to in part. So we divided um, on preliminary um, the fjord region into um, 12 to 14 biogeographic subunits, three longitudinal, three um, uh, from east to west, plus um, um, four um, exceptional parts. And this is one part of the story. Already 15 minutes gone? Incredible, <laughs> okay. Well, this is one part of the story. And um, this is the other part of the story. There is a lot of development going on. Infrastructure, road building, um, electric lines, industry fisheries um, increasing, number of small-scale fishers increasing, and last but not least, aquaculture increasing. So what we can find is that we have a mixture of high diversity, complex systems, complex patterns, very fast economic development, but low grade of knowledge. And this is a problematic mixture. So this gives a lot of difficulty for the management of impacting activities. And actually, we are not based on the information that we have at hand right now. It is almost impossible to give reliable recommendations on how impacting activities should be modified to avoid um, irreparable um, uh, damages. We also believe that with the um, given conditions in, in science and the development in science, we will not be able to fill the gaps in short time. And the short time is needed because the development is very, very fast. Just to give, well, publications are rising, and, but if we are optimistic and have, let's say, 50 publications on biology for the entire fjord region, this would mean one publication for each 1,500 kilometers a year. That is nothing. So our recommendation is that the only realistic um, mean of management is the establishment of sufficient and um, um, good selected marine protected areas, highly protected marine protected areas, internationally called marine reserves, here in Chile called Parques Marinos, because they are the only possibility to back up any management experiment that we are going to practice in areas outside these um, highly protected areas. And of course, we have to promote um, scientific activity in this region and um, to um, create a, um, a science that is helps to find these spots. Inventories are first of important step and this comes where the um, sense of marine life already, um, already stepped in. And of course we need more and better in research infrastructure to attract more science to the re and fjord region and of course um, adequate logistic possibilities. So we try to attract come to Chile, come to the Chilean fjord region, do research, it's interesting, it's important, and you won't forget it, regret it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> questions can be asked either in English or Spanish or, or German, whatever you like. Yeah, we have space for two questions only. ¿Cuántos tipos de hábitat eh, lograron identificar dentro de un solo fiordo? Uh, cantidad de hábitats. La verdad es que para eso me cuesta dar una, una respuesta, um, porque um, nosotros todavía estamos indecididos cómo um, separar los diferentes hábitats, um, porque ahí tenemos gradientes adentro del, a lo largo del fiordo donde no hay limitaciones muy obvias. Entonces, una separación en diferentes hábitats sería más o menos arbitrario. Seguramente tenemos una estratificación en la profundidad y ahí depende también mucho del fiordo. En Comao se podría decir que por lo menos tenemos una, en el Ventus una estratificación en siete um, um, zonas uh, principales. Lo que es, por supuesto se podría todavía subdividir en, 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 en más. Last question, please. 
you know, is that there any permissible effect of tourism in, in this area? <laughs> well, um, there is not much tourism at all <laughs> so far. Um, so, um, right now, I would say we are at a point where any effect of tourism would be positive because it would add um, a value to, to these ecosystems that hasn't been considered um, of, of major importance so far. So, I would say right now, any impact of tourism, um, um, especially um, observ observatory tourism, um, at this point, at this stage, would be positive and welcome. Okay, all the other questions, I'm sorry, all the other questions on the round table at the end of the evening. Thank you.